Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second episode of the Patch Hygiene webinar series. And if you're joining us from last week, welcome back. I'm Matt Coker with Champion Solutions Group, and with me again today is the very talented Dan Powers. So a quick review of what we went over last week. Let's just get the slides moving here, Dan. Sorry, I was on pause. <laughs> so a quick review of what we kind of went over last week and also just to reiterate guys this is uh, part two of our four-part series and as we continue to progress uh, we will get more in depth into patching and big fix each episode is only about 30 minutes or so and as we move into each week uh, we're building on what we discussed from uh, the previous episodes until we can get into an automated patch environment so last week we discussed uh, some of the basics about big fix we talked about uh, ease of deployment the different modules inside of big fix and, and more importantly you got to see uh, these live patches that we we sent out to a couple machines there in real time so while we showed you functionality uh, that's about as far as we got now we're going to build upon uh, this week and just get a little deeper so looking at this week's overview, uh, we're gonna cover four main topics. First of all, a baseline. Last week, you saw us take action with patches on a, a couple machines, which is fine and great, you know, to show you how it works. Uh, but in reality, when you do your patching, you're going to have uh, quite a few patches, most likely every month. So we put these patches in what is called a baseline, which is nothing more than a container that can hold multiple actions, uh, fixlets or patches, and then we can send them out to all of our targets. And we call this a baseline because uh, these machines run through these baselines and then as they're completed, uh, they should all be at the same baseline in terms of patching. A fairly simple concept and uh, we're gonna do it live here in a moment. So you'll get to see uh, everything that we're discussing firsthand. So with that, we also want to group our, uh, our servers and our desktops together. So right away, some of the things we can think about is patching desktops uh, versus servers are usually different from a change management standpoint. Uh, Big Fix can easily create an automatic group uh, that can group all of your desktops versus all of your servers. And as you can see here in the screen, all of your you know, Windows desktops, your Mac desktops, uh, very simple to group automatically. We can also detect if SQL Server is running on a box and automatically add these endpoints uh, into this group. So it's automatically placed into a special grouping, if you will. Another type of group in, in Big Fix is a manual group. Some servers, when going through your patching, uh, we're just you know, not allowed to reboot these particular machines. So we have to manage them individually if we decide to do this. The concept here is we are just trying to um, organize all of our different servers and desktops so when we do take an action against them, we don't have to individually select them. Another big piece, uh, just like we showed the compliance report from last week, we can actually reuse these reports and add the different groups that we created so uh, now that we can leverage that same report and show compliancy across all of our desktops, servers, or even you know, our exchange servers or SQL servers uh, if we want or even need to. So with that said, um, let's turn it over to the maestro, Dan Powers, and he is going to show us live what all this looks like in real time. Thank you, Matt, for that. And thank you, everybody, for joining again. And if we have new people out here, just remember we do record the uh, videos. We are going to keep building on these. So uh, the first thing I wanted to show is, is some of these computer groups. So this is our lab environment. And as Matt had indicated, Big Fix very easily can create what, what we try to do is always an automatic group, something that is maintained automatically in the system. Uh, very simple, I don't have any Macs in my environment, but very simple to create a group, if you will, and all we're doing is telling it the, the operating system has to say Mac in it. Same thing with Windows desktops, servers, and so forth. These are very easily done inside of the Big Fix uh, program and console and as endpoints join your environment they will automatically go into these automatic groups uh, just as matt had kind of indicated as well for the sql side 
that's just an example. We could do this with Exchange, all sorts of things, right? We can detect if Exchange Server or SQL Server or IIS or Apache, all these different things are installed and automatically have these machines start going up into these groups, which are great for our targeting purposes, especially in patching, and even when we run our various reports. The other thing I wanted to point out to you is you do have this idea of manual groups. So in a lot of the places that I've gone to, uh, we find that there are some servers that you're allowed to reboot during your change management cycle and some that you're not. So a lot of times we have to create these different groups out of here for rebooting our servers. And we can even, as the example I showed us here, is the difference between prod servers, dev servers, and these groups can get more and more and more of them as your environment is more complex. Um, and from the get-go, it's usually very difficult out of the box to create an automatic grouping of these servers. So it's something that we have to do manually and we have to maintain that. So of course, this is an issue at the moment. And in next week's webinar, we're gonna show you how to get around this. But I did wanna bring up these groupings and you guys all on the phone can think about how you group your servers at the moment. So now that we have our groups down, I'm gonna go into my custom site for, for patching for Windows. And since I did bring up the concept of reboots, notice that what we had done here is we created some custom fixlets. Um, and one of these I'm gonna kick off on my machine right now just so we can see it go. And then we'll go back to it here is we take those different reboots. We have the concept that we might wanna reboot a machine um, only if it needs to be rebooted. So FYI, here's my little action window that's popping up on my machine. So when we talked about, as, as Matt had indicated, desktops versus servers. Desktops, we usually have a looser knit change control, if you will, um, and we still wanna patch them and we still have to reboot them, but somebody could be given a webinar, working on a presentation and so forth. So I don't wanna just force them to reboot their box on my schedule. You wanna work this out with works in your organization and you can throw some information up here that's saying, okay, for example, based on our company policy, we have to patch you within 24 hours, you know, six hours, we need to reboot you if need be, but we give them the ability to snooze. Right. So again, since I'm doing the webinar at the moment, I am going to snooze that reboot function. So that's a very nice one to have. And the same thing when we're looking at uh, rebooting the server side of it, I have a forced reboot, if we notice here, and the relevancy is just true. So this just reboots the box when I send this fixlet to a server. And I also have another one in here that's a dynamic reboot. So I wanna make sure the servers has been up and running for at least five minutes. I don't wanna constantly keep rebooting it. And this particular one, notice my relevancy has fairly simple here. We know Big Fix detects that the machine is pending a restart, meaning it needs to restart, most likely due to a patch I just installed, and it's been up for at least five minutes. So it's something very easy uh, as far as fixlets that we always kind of put in place. And I'm gonna show you how I leverage them in the baselines Matt was just referring to and talking about. So I have a few baselines here. I have one that I did for desktops. And if we notice in here, I got my patches in the middle for whatever patches I wanted to deploy in this baseline. But beforehand, I do this pre-boot. If it determines that the desktop needs to be rebooted, to me, best practices, I wanna reboot you before I install new patches. So in this particular case, it's my interactive desktop reboot patch. So if the user pauses this, the rest of the patches will pause given my time window. In my example, I gave myself or my users four hours. You have to figure out what works in your environment. But he will reboot the box if need be. If my machine didn't require a reboot, I would just start installing the patches behind the scenes, not bothering the user yet. He doesn't really know anything's happening. And then at the bottom, again, I'm going to do that interactive reboot. So maybe my machine didn't need a reboot right away, 
So I would deploy the patches, but if my machine did need a reboot afterwards, I would get that pop-up like I showed you a moment ago and telling the user, hey, based on security policies, we patched your machine. We have to give you X hours before we force a reboot on you, but we let the users postpone it. And just note, if there's no user logged on to the system at the time, that interaction window won't come up. And it'll actually just take the reboot action if no one's actually logged on. So there's an example of me doing a baseline or a decent best practices for a baseline for desktop systems. Now we have this concept that we have our servers. Well, as I had mentioned, most places I've ever gone to have servers that we are allowed to reboot during their patch cycle. So we can also, again, just throw in the force reboot here. If you notice, I did a forced reboot at 60 seconds, meaning it's not interactive. I don't expect someone to be on the server console, uh, so I'm not popping anything up on the screen. And if I'm, if I'm in my change window for a server, I am going to reboot him, and I like to do it, whether he wants a reboot or not, before I do any patches. My reasoning for that is a lot of times, especially in the Windows world, I've seen folks have a server that's been online for, for months, right? And then they go to patch it, they put patches in place, and then they restart it, and the system doesn't come, come back up. And it's very easy to blame the patches that we installed as the root cause when that may not be the case. There may have been something pending on a machine um, that was going to cause my, my failure to come back up. So it, the reason I do the reboot beforehand is I want to make sure that if the server doesn't come up, it wasn't because I installed a bunch of patches to the box. Um, and again, I've seen this over and over again at every client I've been to, even to some virtual servers where a week before <clears throat> an engineer had changed the backend LUNs on the box's disks. Um, we rebooted the box before our patches. The system didn't come up. The, they were immediately, oh, the patch caused a problem. And I'm like, no, guys, we rebooted before we deployed any patch. There must have been something else. So right away, we didn't dive into a patch causing a problem. And more quickly, they found, oh, the backend LUNs had changed. And they fixed it. The server came back online, and we went through our patching. So again, I like that forced reboot. Now, after I do my patches, I will do a dynamic reboot. The only difference there is that, again, the machine has to be at least up and running for at least five minutes. I just do that so we don't constantly reboot something. Um, but it also detects, is the machine pending a reboot? Big Fix is smart enough to understand if any of the patches I put in place actually require a reboot for that patch to be successfully installed. So on some of my servers, I may get them that they are pending a restart, so they will restart one more time before uh, my patch window ends here. And for servers that don't need a restart, I don't restart them again. I just let them get back to work. Now, something else you might have noticed here, I have this pre-run script and a post-run script. So, <coughs> excuse me, we developed this kind of a while ago, and this to me helps the, the guy that has to patch. In most environments, when you're patching your servers, you as the person running the patches may not have intimate knowledge of every server you're patching, what it actually does, what applications actually run on it. So what we did as a company standard is we simply look for something very simple. And if I go to the source on this guy, we can take a look at it to the description. It simply looks for a C script prepatch.bat. If it exists, that means this Fixlet will be relevant for that server. If it doesn't exist, it's not relevant. And what it does, it actually will execute that batch file, which is under the control of the application owners, and looks at the exit code. If the exit code exits with a zero exit code, we will continue our patching process. If it does not exit with a zero exit code, we will actually no, not patch. So some of the things I've seen people put into this, for an example, was, uh, especially on uh, database servers, is they would put in their scripts that they would quintessent their database. Or maybe it's an application server that said, hey, if you're going to patch my you know, web server, I need to shut these websites down first before you do so. So again, it gives you great flexibility. 
and also now that you don't have to create individual fixlets for every type of server in your environment. It also puts the onus back on the application owners, A, if they even want to do this, and they write the scripts because they're subject matter experts in their applications. So this has worked very well for us. It's fairly simple to run. And if you notice, I also have a post script. Same idea from this one, same directory structure. If a post script exists, my baseline will execute it after I'm done all my patching, after I reboot the box. And again, some of the things that you can put into this is database server. Well, check to make sure that the different databases came online. Maybe there's an application and they need to do something once a machine reboots. They could automatically put this into the patching window. And again, it's helping us automate our system. So hopefully that made sense to you folks. And if you want some more examples of that, uh, just hit us up in the questions. The other thing to note is if we look at the difference between these two, reboot and no reboot, the only difference is, is I took the reboot fixlet out of here. These are servers that we can patch, but at this point, we are no longer able to reboot the box. So right away, if we notice, I'm starting to have multiple baselines in my environment. Now, I can target these as the groups that I created, the servers versus desktops, the reboot versus no reboot. Um, and also now I also have to send out multiple actions to all of my various servers and groups depending on when their change window is. So we're slowly building our automated patch sequence. There's still a lot of work here. I still have to create multiple baselines because in most production environments, I may have a whole list here. I just gave us a quick example of three, desktops versus servers and reboot versus no reboot. But in a production environment, I've seen people create a baseline and then manipulate that baseline about 10 times for different types of servers, different types of actions they're trying to run, whether they can reboot it or not reboot it, when during the month their change window for different servers are open. So while Big Fix is very great at helping us with this, I noticed they were still doing a lot of manual efforts. And this is something we're going to keep building upon uh, in the next two webinars to show you how we can get around this and really get down to really one baseline to do some of these things. So with that, I want to show how do we build our baselines. Uh, here's one of the ones that I like. It's in Big Fix Labs. This, no matter what modules you own in Big Fix, you do have access to the Big Fix labs. You just need to turn it on. And if we go to the sites down here towards the bottom, we have this patching wizard. And you could enable it for master operators or non-master operators. I usually just do it for the master operators. And then what that'll end up doing is creating this little patching wizard right here. And it will load up in... Um, my big fix console when I'm going to create my patches. So I'm going to walk you through. This is one of the ways I would create a baseline. So for example, we already know the year. By default, it's going to select the latest year and the month we're in. In this case, I just have patches for Windows enabled. But if I had Linux, Mac, uh, AIX, Solaris, all those other ones, they would appear in this drop down list. So let's say I need to do a baseline for April and March out of the year 2019, patches for Windows. I'm gonna hit next here. The Big Fix wizard will find all of the patches that are in that time frame, And then the first thing I can do is come in here and sort on applicability. So if you notice, what I wanna do is pick all the ones that have at least a one in here. All the ones that are zero aren't applicable for my environment. Um, this is the one thing where I wish this wizard did have a little button that simply said, don't don't show me patches that are not applicable, meaning a zero count would have made me selecting these a little bit quicker, but still this is not so bad. I just have to walk up here and select all these guys that I do want in here. Um, also note, as I select these, <clears throat> there is a filter here. If I was only looking for critical, um, I could have typed that in here and it would have only found the critical patches, as you can see. So there's multiple ways to filter this as well. But once I get the different patches that I want, I can hit the next button. 
The next button is going to ask me, okay, I'm going to go create a baseline for you. What custom site do you want to put it in? Well, in my case, I want to put this in patching for Windows. Makes sense. I am going to have a couple check boxes here. If you have multiple languages, which usually is not the case, but if you do, you can combine the fixlets. Um, I don't. Everything's English in my lab. Um, you have the capability of copying the fixlets into a custom site. I'm going to choose not to do that in this case, but one of the reasons you may want to do that, and I'll tell you, is if you find, for example, this happens a lot with Java updates. Um, maybe Java installed perfectly fine, but during your QA process, you determined that updating Java on the accounting machines that run a particular piece of software breaks some of the modules because it relies on a certain piece of Java. If I copy the fixlet into there, um, I am allowed, then I can add relevance to it. And I could detect if that application was on a box and tell that Java update not to install there. If I don't copy the fixlet, of course, it remains in the external site from IBM. And even as master operator, I can edit the relevance. So that's one of the reasons you may copy them. But what I'm going to do here is build our baseline. And I'm just going to hit next. And it gives me a summary. Here's everything I'm going to do. I'm not going to copy the fixlets. I'm not going to create an action at this time because I don't want to create an action at this time. I'm going to use it later. And I can just hit next. And the system itself will go create my baseline for me. So it's really decent way to create a baseline very quick. And if I go back into here into all content, go back into my baseline, we could see the baseline that got created. It kind of uses this date stamp, patches for Windows, 2019, April and March. And I have a baseline to start with, if you notice from here, by using that wizard. So that's a great way to jumpstart this scenario into creating your baselines. I notice our time is getting away from us. So notice we only have 30 minutes. But for those of you that um, haven't used that wizard, I highly recommend it. It's one of the easiest ways to create a baseline. Now, with that, what I want to do is go back into our PowerPoint presentation for a moment. Um, and let's just talk about something real quick. Again, desktop versus servers. One of the things we notice as you're patching your systems, uh, desktops, we, we need to usually interact with the end user. We can't just willy-nilly reboot desktops around when we feel like it. People are online doing things all hours of the night and day, whether they're remote or not. So we do need to give them the option to postpone rebooting and putting patches in place. Very simple to do. Um, again, the same thing with the reboot. We don't want to force a reboot on the desktop servers, especially if someone's in the middle of a presentation or working on you know, some document that they need to get out and we reboot their box. They're going to hate you forever. So we don't do that. Another concept is remember, you can always make offers in Big Fix. And we've done this multiple times at very large organizations where we put the patches together for desktops and we will actually give them an offer before the SLA is due. People get used to that and a lot of times they will accept that offer and get their systems patched long before our SLA, before we force it on them in, in a sense. We also have the concept of servers. Let's face it, our servers have a tighter change control. We usually have to go to a cab meeting. Our different servers are in different times that we're allowed to reboot them, not reboot them. When can they get patched? Is it on the weekend? Is it at night? All these things. No interaction. Um, we don't give them a postpone option. Again, we don't expect users on the servers. And during our change window, we need to get our patching and updates done as quickly as possible. Um, and again, we don't reboot. Um, machines unless we're allowed to do so. So again, all of these things are quite doable in the big fix environment, even to the little thing of the pre and post script that I had shown with you guys. The next thing that we're going to focus in on is just what I was talking about is that change management. This is where we're going to build upon what we did this week, next week, is we have to start somewhere with change management. So what I found is most people understand the second Tuesday of the month, which is Patch Tuesday from when Microsoft releases their patches. So we use this as kind of our starting point when we're talking about rolling patches out in our SLAs. Everybody seems to get the second Tuesday of the month, even if I'm patching Unix machines, right? So what we look at that is say, okay, we're going to take Group A, I'll just call it Group A, um, but it's probably your test systems. And that'll be the Wednesday to the following Tuesday 
following the patch Tuesday of the month. And we can organize our, our machines, whether they're desktops or servers, into this test systems. That gives us a week to roll out our baselines, to create our baselines, go through cab, push it out. And we usually always target test systems. And here's why is A, we want to make sure the patches get deployed properly. Um, it also, Microsoft as well as the other vendors uh, can release a patch and two days later can supersede that patch. So this gives us a week burn in time to make sure that we get the proper patches rolled out. After that, we usually go into a QA systems. Uh, which I'm simply going to call Group B. <clears throat> what those systems are is we did the testing. We kind of superseded some patches maybe. We got the patches we want to roll out. Now we're going to expand past just testing systems, just did the patches go in and not, you know, blue screen to death our machines, but maybe the IT department, maybe some of your test bed folks. And what we're going to do now is run this because notoriously Java, for an example, patching Java may install perfectly well, but may have break uh, an application, right? That requires certain versions of Java. So we kind of figured that out, out in the QA systems so that we can not update that Java patch, for an example, where it might break some systems. Um, the next example after that, once we get it, which again, I'm just going to call group C, is our production systems. At this point, we've had a couple weeks to burn in our patches. Now we're going to mass target our production systems. And just because it, the month allows us before the next patch Tuesday, even if it rolls into the next month, is the fourth week. And that's what I call group D. And that's our sensitive systems. And the sensitive systems can be anything from your boss's PC, the CEO's PC, right, where you want to make sure you don't mess up. Up, or they could literally be the most sensitive servers you have. And at this point, you should be really confident that your process, your change management, everything is working uh, as, as appropriate. So hopefully that makes sense. And I know we had a couple questions. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. James Shanks uh, joined us today and he said, you know, how do you enable the different OSs for the patch wizard? Um, so that's a good question, James. First, you have to enable them in the console itself. Um, so if I pop back in here, hopefully I can get this for you real quick. Hold on. So <clears throat> first of all, if you go to big fix management and we go into the license overview and again, everybody's going to differ here. It depends on what you have. So I'm going to shut some of these life cycle ones down and go towards patch. Um, so, so the patching for windows will cover your, your updates applications as well. So notice the updates for Macs, updates for Windows apps did not appear in that dropdown, but the patches actually did. So just, just note that. Um, but you would have to enable different patches. So again, you know, in my environment, I don't have Red Hat, you know, I don't have Mac OS, even though I created the group for one, right, visually, but I actually don't have it enabled. You would enable, need to enable these First of all, if you enable these, they should start showing up in your drop down list on the big fix patching wizard. Excellent. Uh, Henry, Lee, Henry Lee asked us uh, Can big fix run uh, discovery or probe scan on the network to identify any host that does not have big fix? So we can uh, even assign the host manually to a group. The issues is the host does not have big fix, big fix does not have visibility. So he's asking basically that's why discovery comes into play. He said, not sure if this is on a topic for this webinar or not, though. It, it is, but that's fine. We can answer it real quick. It's a good question. So that's what you're going to do, the unmanaged assets. So, again, I don't have this running in the lab, but what unmanaged assets is, is you can create – it runs Nmap. Um, you can run this on any endpoint in your environment. Usually we would – install the uh, as unmanaged asset probe scanner where I put my relays. Why? Most likely, you know, if you put your relays in sub offices, you know, there's a reason you put those relays there. That's where I would probably put the um, on it managed asset tool. Uh, and it installs with just a fixlet inside a big fix. And then I would create a profile. So if you're familiar with Nmap or if you're not, it's basically 
telling Nmap how to run. Hey, I want to scan the network. I either can be, you know, Nmap can be very aggressive at scanning your network, um, which you may want to talk with your network folks and even your security team, um, because we've done this at banks and so forth, and we aggressively scanned. And of course, the security team, you know, threw up red flags. <laughs> they they thought it was an issue. So you want to have that conversation with everybody. Um, but you can scan those devices, and what will happen is every device on your network that is pingable during that process will show up here. So I'll see printers, routers, phones, all devices that are on the IP subnet. Now at that point, Big Fix will try to look at the box. It'll probe for 52.311. It'll also compare the information that it found from Nmap with what's inside of Big Fix for running agents. And again, I wish I had this running here and I don't, but we would see a label here, uh, Bez Computer that would show me, hey, yeah, I found this during my Nmap scan, but it is a, it is already, it has a big fix agent on it. Um, then it will also show me ones that don't. So the other feature in there as well is that, let's say it discovered, you know, your routers, your switches, your printers, your phones. I could click a button here, organize it by device type, and I can hide or remove those and also tell the scanning importer that says, hey, next time the imports run, um, if I've deleted this object, don't pull it back in. So to answer your question, right, if I don't care to see the printers, iPhones, and all these things, I would delete them once and they wouldn't come back in unless it was a new device. And then from here, this is now at least showing me, hey, what does, you know, what does not have a big fix agent out there that I could deploy an agent to? And then from this screen, we can select these machines and leverage the uh, big fix installer to, to push that out. Now with that, and again, not to get crazy off topic here, but um, let me just see if I can find it real quick. Go back to all content, sorry, uh, come on. Yeah, well, Dan, while you're pulling that up, we got some great questions flowing in here, guys. We'll stay over as long as you want to stay on and answer as many as we can get to. So, just wanted to put that in there. Yeah, so let's go to the big fix management. So, so one of those also is is in here. Oh, it's on the upgrade part. I always oh, it, it this install big fix tool. So notice I have this. So the the client deployment tool, and people get very confused on this. Um, what this allows you to do, and again, I usually put this on my relays, right? Um, this is really not a lot different than if you ran the manual install client wizard when you first installed Big Fix, kind of either scanned your network or picked AD groups. Um, this tool works when it's on the relays, it can really work everywhere, but I put it on the relays. And what I can then do from the unmanaged assets, if I find a bunch of machines, let's just say they're in a remote office, right? They're, and I get the IP address. I can then say, okay, for those machines, I'm gonna send a fixlet to that relay and tell that relay to utilize the big fixed client deploying tool and to try to install on those machines that I that I found from the unmanaged assets. Um, <clears throat> why it works that way is it gets around firewalls, right? So if I try to do the install from the big fix server um, and I'm trying to hit a remote office or better yet servers in your DMZ, uh, remember the big fix client install tool tries to mount like the C hidden drive and uses that SMB SIFS protocol to copy the files back and forth. Well, especially in your DMZ and most likely in some of your remote offices, your firewall may block that. So again, if but if I have a relay there and I have this tool installed there, I can send the big fix command to that relay, get past the firewall and tell that server, hey, on the local subnet, go install these clients. And then you should see it work uh, fairly well. So I know that was real quick update on that, but that, that's how we do it inside of big fix. All right. Uh, Keith Thurston asked, um, is it possible to download patches to the clients without applying and apply them at a later time? Yes. If not, have you seen any issues applying patches and reboot at a later time? It, yeah. So a couple of, so two different questions, but let's just take one real quick. I'm just going to jump into patch management where I'm going to randomly pick a patch here and I don't really care what I pick. So bear with me here. So let's say, do, it's an update for Visio. So when I go to take action, 
right? By default, it's right here. Um, by default, it's just going to start, right? It starts because it knows the time that I'm kicking this off, and it's going to end in 48 hours. And just FYI, our server is running in the cloud. It's actually on the other coast, so that's why the time is different. Um, but what I can do is I can start this at a later date. So let's say, you know what? I want these patches to actually install on Saturday, um, and I'm going to give it to Sunday, let's just say, right? So in this case, I'm not starting this for two days. So one of the things I can come down to is click this button right here, uh, start client downloads before the constraints are satisfied. Now, I could also do this at the baseline level, so I don't have to do it for every individual patch. I'm just showing you as an example here. So what this will start doing is it will actually start pre-caching your patches, right? If it has to go out to the vendor, pull them to the big fix server, out to the relays, all the way down to your client endpoints. And it will be in the big fix cache that's there waiting for this date, which is Saturday at 6.33 at night, right? So hopefully by that time, the patches will all be there. And we do this a lot on servers, especially in some of our clients where our change windows were incredibly small. So we would pre-cache our patches to the boxes before the change window started. Right, so that when the window did open up for us, you know, again, I would reboot the box. That's just my best practice. If you have a life cycle and they're virtual machines, I would also snapshot the box. I would call the API over and snapshot the machine before I started deploying my patches as well. And then my patches are locally on the cache. It's just going to rip through them really quick. Now, that works perfectly. Another thing I wanted to point out, um, if you know you're going to do a lot of them to a lot of servers, and I know I have a couple days, I might come in here and change this to 120 or something. The default five is useless. What this is telling all the servers I target, hey, in the next two, two hours, those are minutes, 120 minutes, I want you to randomly start coming and grabbing your, your content, your patches. Why do I do this? I'm being network nice. Instead of pushing out a lot of data all at once and maybe flooding you know, a remote office or flooding your network for, for 10 minutes, um, having it stagger the load so that you know, I'm just not blasting your network all at once. It works really well when you push things out in the future. Now, the flip side of that, I will tell you, is also remember the size of your caches. So you have to remember the size of your relay caches and how caching works. Um, if the if the cache gets filled up, he'll start throwing out the oldest and not used stuff. So we want to make sure you have enough cache set on your relays and also on your clients. Because if by default, it's one gig cache size. And let's just say you're rolling out Windows 10 updates. We know the new Windows 10 updates are very large. If you're going to pre-cache that, you need to change your cache settings on your clients as well. Otherwise, you'll get things like disk limited or disk constraint messages inside a big fix, especially when you uh, pre-cache stuff. Okay, and is that, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, all right. So uh, Fernando Martinez asked, any chance to get access to the custom content that you've written? Is there a GitHub? Yeah, or yeah we um, sometimes I do. So yeah, great, great question. Actually, I don't actually put a lot of stuff on on GitHub. I have on BigFix.me. We also have stuff on our website. If there's certain things you're looking for. Uh, J please ping us, let us know. I'll be happy to share it with you. Um, I do need to get some more of this stuff up on our website. By the way, we already determined as we're doing this, all the stuff we're going to show you, we are going to put up in a zip file up in our website so you can download it. Um, all, the co all the custom content I've used, when we're done with this, I'm going to put in a zip file and put up on our website, wow. and we'll send that out to you. So great question there. Um, I, I, and I, we probably should be posting more stuff on GitHub. It's something that I don't do very often. I do reply on bigfix.me a lot in the forums, but I, I don't post a lot of stuff on GitHub, I'd have to say. Yeah. Slack has a good community too for, for, uh, yeah. But we will, and, and again, if, if anything you see here, you're asking us for it, just send us an email. I'll send it to you. I have no problem with that. All right. So, uh, Gavin Turner asked, how do you account for the size of patches and getting them out without killing the network? That's a, a really good question. So one of them is to stagger the downloads. 
right? So again, if if you're pushing things out, you can also, there also is a tool to pre-cache stuff just to your relays, right? Um, so I'm showing you how to do it while you're taking action. There is another wizard, and maybe next week we'll throw that in there if we have time, where you can actually pre-cache stuff to your relays. So at least it's on all your relays before you get it to the clients. Um, and then again, same thing, you can stagger that update or run it at night, right? So alleviate some of the network load. The other concept of that, of course, you know, if you go in once you get some of your patches, and you can make a report out of this, randomly picking on the Visio update, it's telling me the file size, right? So I can create a report, I can create a baseline, hey, here's my baseline, here's the patches we're gonna roll with, um, and then I can create a report looking at that baseline that would total up all the size. So let's say I'm pushing, you know, 15 different patches out or, or 100 patches out this month, um, I could calculate the size of all of them so I know in my head or on paper, um, hey, by the way, we're pushing approximately one gig of patches around our network in this patch cycle. So that information is here. Hopefully hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Uh, Daniel Sun asked, uh, can uh, post-patch dynamic reboot yes. be used for Linux systems requiring reboots after patch? Absolutely. So absolutely the same. And, and one of the cool things I do like about Big Fix, right? So if we go in here, like um, do dynamic patches, go back into the details here. This is the one I wanted. Yeah. So this thing here, right here, this, this is Big Fix relevancy, right? So the agent interprets this. So whether this was a Windows box, a Max box, an AIX, Solaris, what, whatever, that command right there, pending restart, tells if the machine needs a restart regardless of operating system. Uptime you know, of operating system greater than five minutes. That works across OSs. So yes, everything we're doing here does work across your OS systems, right? So that whole idea of does it need a reboot? You know, Has it been up for at least X minutes? Um, I also, just FYI, it's not covered in this webinar, but there is a video we have out there to use catch patch up. Um, the concept is, hey, as you create baselines all year, what do you do with those baselines after you've run them? Well, we don't throw them away. We put them in a special site. Um, and our reasoning for that is, is a couple reasons. You may have somebody that took their desktop and went on maternity leave, someone that's been off network and maybe the big fix agent wasn't working for whatever reason, and they come back online and they're three months behind patches, right? Or, or <clears throat> let's say you're doing bare metal deployment, whether it's Windows, Linux, or whatever, and your gold image, let's face it, as soon as I create my gold image, it's like driving a car off the dealership. As soon as I leave the parking lot, it's used. Um, same thing happens with our gold image, right? Gold images are usually around for a few months, and let's face it, there's a lot of patches to those images you know, if you bare metal a new environment. So one of the things that we do is even in our bare metal process is before we make a system, whether it's Windows, desktop, server, or Linux, we run it through our catch patch up site um, because we don't call it production yet. And we make it run through all of our old baselines so that we're ensured that all the proper patches that you've been working so hard for all year get applied to these new systems or systems that may have been off the network for a while. Um, and that brings them back under compliance really quick before they hit um, uh, production. Hope so hopefully that answered your question as well. Yeah, it's really good, Dan. Um, last one I have for the day, uh, just, you know, would you, same same person, Daniel Sun asked, would you use examples of Linux for later webinars? Uh, we certainly can. So I, I, the reason we pick Windows, obviously we know everybody has it because <laughs> um, we've been asked, oh, can you show me how to do this on AIX? It, the, the group of that is obviously smaller. The concepts of what we're dealing with, the, the, the pre-script, the post-scripts, the reboots, not reboots, this thing works universally across the operating system. So I use the Windows systems just because that's what I have in my lab. We're doing a lot of Windows 10 updates and so forth. Um, but yeah, we can certainly, so it's a great question. And maybe what we can do in the future coming up is we'll do a whole uh, Nix webinar 
right? And saying, hey, how, what, what's best practices for Unix, whether it's Linux, AIX, Solaris? Uh, so it's a, it's a great question, Matt. We should probably write that down for a future webinar uh, that we, we concentrate on not Windows systems because there are some nuances. Um, but again, you know, the big fix relevancy and a lot of this stuff, it, it works exactly the same, right? Um, it really does. E even something like this, if you notice, you know, I'm going to reboot the box. But I also set a custom timer saying, hey, when was the last time Big Fix rebooted your server? I use that in reports. This line right here will work regardless of operating system. Uh, in the Windows world, it's going to write a registry key. In the Mac, it's going to write an IO registry key. In the Unix environment, it's going to put it into a config file, right? So the Big Fix agent does a lot of this work for me. Um, but it's a gr still a good question. There are some nuances when you're dealing with the uh, Unix world, let's say, in Big Fix. But again, 90% of it works the same when you use the action and relevance language. Awesome. Well, Dan, that's all the questions we have today. So I hope uh, he was able to answer everything for you. Make sure you tune in next week as we get into part three. And uh, we'll see you then. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so so just to follow up next week, again, we're going to build on this and we're going to take that last concept that I just talked about, which is this. And what we're trying to do is automate some of this. We're trying to alleviate where we don't have manual groups and we're going to leverage a source of truth that we could adhere to your change management system. So hopefully we'll see you again next week as we build upon this further. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan.